Do you know how those two hormones regulate your blood glucose concentration? This is from module six, that big module that is content heavy in AQA. This is an example of homeostasis that uses negative feedback. Let's just start with a definition of, of negative feedback. It's basically that idea, isn't it? That if there's any change away from the norm, it will cause a corrective mechanism to reverse that change. So for example, if there's any increase or any decrease in your blood glucose concentration away from that normal set point, it will initiate a corrective response or mechanism to reverse that change. This is what we're gonna look at today. So let's start with your blood glucose concentration is too high. It has gone above normal. Maybe you've just eaten loads of sugar, loads of chocolate, loads of cake. Uh, anyway, or maybe just a big baked potato. Your blood glucose level has risen. You've digested the starch in that potato. You've absorbed the glucose via your small intestine into your blood. It has shot up. What is going to happen? Obviously, it's the pancreas that we're going to talk about, but specifically, if your blood glucose is too high, it's the beta cells in the islets of Langerhans that secrete insulin, okay? So it's not good enough anymore to just say the pancreas. Yes, it is the pancreas, but it's regions of the pancreas. It's the endocrine regions of the pancreas called the islets of Langerhans. And within the islets of Langerhans, it's the beta cells specifically that are going to secrete the insulin. Now, insulin is a hormone that's made out of protein. It's going to travel in the bloodstream. It's a chemical messenger. It's going to bind to its receptors. So let's go there next. Now, there are receptors for insulin on many different tissues, loads of different tissues, but the ones we focus on for A-level are the liver cells and the skeletal muscle cells. So insulin binds to receptors on liver cells, which are called hepatocytes, and skeletal muscle cells. Now, it doesn't actually move into these cells because it's made of protein. It can't cross the phospholipid bilayer. It's too big. But what it will do is activate enzymes within those cells. And this might sound like I'm being picky, but you will be penalised if you imply that insulin itself is directly doing these things. It's not even getting into the liver cell. It's not even getting into the muscle cell. It's not doing it directly, but when it binds to its receptor, it is going to activate enzymes within the cell that cause the following things to happen. And it's an example of the second messenger model, which we're going to look at in a separate video because we don't have time to cover everything in this one. But insulin activates enzymes that cause um, an increase in the cell's permeability to glucose. And this is because more carrier proteins for glucose, more carrier proteins for glucose are inserted or added into the cell membrane. So when insulin binds to the receptors, it activates enzymes. These enzymes will cause vesicles that contain carrier proteins to move towards and fuse with the cell membrane. You don't have to know it in that much detail, but you should know you're going to get an increase in carrier proteins and that's going to increase the cell's permeability to glucose. So more glucose diffuses into the cells. And this is removing glucose from the blood. So obviously this is going to help to bring your blood glucose level back down to normal because more glucose is leaving the blood and diffusing into the liver cells or into the muscle cells. Insulin also activates enzymes that cause glycogenesis. 
don't say insulin causes glycogenesis, okay? Insulin activates enzymes, and it's the enzymes within the cell that actually cause glycogenesis. But glycogenesis, as the name suggests, is making glycogen from glucose. Makes sense, doesn't it? Look, glycogen, genesis. So glucose is going to be joined together with many glycosidic bonds, and it's going to be stored as glycogen in the liver cells, in the skeletal muscle cells, because glycogen is large, it's insoluble, it's highly branched, it's perfect for storage, and ultimately we're getting the glucose out of the blood and storing it away in the liver cells and muscle cells, so the blood glucose level will return back to normal. Right, I need to get a board rubber because we still haven't even done glucagon. So let's rub this off and talk about the flip side of the story and talk about glucagon. So if your blood glucose level falls below normal, so let's say you've been exercising and using up a lot of glucose in respiration, or perhaps you've been fasting, your blood glucose falls below the set point. And this time we're going to go for the alpha cells. And it's the alpha cells in the islets of Langerhans. Again, this is in the pancreas that I'm talking about. They're going to secrete glucagon. Okay, from that endocrine tissue, the islets of Langerhans, but specifically the alpha cells. They're going to secrete glucagon. Now, glucagon is another hormone that's made out of protein. It travels in the blood. We say it's a chemical messenger. But again, because it's made out of protein, it can't diffuse into the cells itself. So it binds to receptors. And again, glucagon receptors are found in several different places, but for A-level biology, we only talk about the ones that are found on the liver. So glucagon binds to receptors on the liver cells and activates enzymes. So glucagon doesn't go into the cell itself. Therefore, we need to remember to tell the examiner that glucagon is not doing the following directly. It's activating enzymes within the cell and it's the enzymes that cause the following effects. This is an example of a second messenger model, which we're gonna do in a separate video. So make sure you check that out as well, because you do need to know the second messenger model for glucagon. But we've got, it binds to receptors on the liver cells. It activates enzymes within the cell and these enzymes cause two things we need to be able to talk about glycogenolysis, which if you break the word down, you've got glycogen and lysis. So it's glycogen being broken back down, or maybe even better to say hydrolyzed into. Okay, makes sense, doesn't it? Glycogenolysis, hydrolyzing glycogen back into glucose. That glucose can then diffuse from the liver cells back into the blood to help increase our blood glucose level and return it back to normal. But the other thing that these enzymes cause is gluconeogenesis, which is making new glucose from non-carbohydrate sources e.g. fatty acids, glycerol, amino acids. Okay, and the word makes sense. You've got gluco, which stands for glucose, neo, which stands for new, and genesis, which means making. So making new glucose from non-carbohydrate sources. You can give examples such as amino acids and fatty acids. That glucose then obviously diffuses back into your bloodstream, brings your blood sugar back up, returns it back to normal. So you're reversing the change and bringing it back up to normal. Now, you don't have to use the keywords if you're getting really confused with glycogenolysis, gluconeogenesis, and glycogenesis. If you're going to mix them up, avoid them. 
because if you mix them up, you spell them wrong, you get it the wrong way around, you're gonna lose marks. So if you're really gonna struggle with the key terms, then use the descriptions instead, because you can still get marks for the descriptions and you're less likely to get them muddled up. But yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot to learn here, but it builds on GCSE. You can learn it kind of as two independent stories, your insulin story, your glucagon story, and then when you're confident with them individually as chunks, you can kind of stick it all together and see how the full picture works for blood glucose regulation. Let me know how you found this video, guys. Let me know how you found this topic. Hopefully, this has helped you because module six is a tough one.